from Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus. My name is Lynn Snaj, and I'm the director of the Arts and Culture Center at the Middle East Institute. Today's podcast is our last program coming out of our 3D immersive Lebanon photo show entitled Lebanon Then and Now that has been featured on our website from July 13 and will be closing on September 29. It's on our site, www.mei.edu. The show, which has brought already 20,000 visitors to our site, was a collaborative effort between several partners, the Institut du Monde Arts, the Beirut Museum of Art USA, the Beirut Center of Photography, and the Association for the Promotion and Exhibition of Art in Lebanon Appeal. MEI is deeply grateful for their commitment and support without which this exhibition would not have been possible. We never expected the show to witness so much. It was already documenting a protest movement, an economic collapse, and so many other painful and difficult sociopolitical issues layered over COVID-19. But we never imagined that it would coincide with such tragedy as the August 4 catastrophic explosion that rocked Beirut and ripped through entire neighborhoods, taking the lives of many and injuring thousands. The blast destroyed large parts of the city and leveled historical neighborhoods that also housed much of the city's vibrant arts district. Lebanese are now trying to restore lives and spirits before they can figure out how to restore their lost architectural splendor and their art scene, which has been deeply impacted at so many levels. The blast has underscored the fragility of life and the built environment and has made the questions of collecting, preserving, and archiving even more relevant and critical than before. And today, we're going to look at the broader challenges around archiving, collecting, around photography and its role in society, but we're going to start with the blast and its impact on these critical questions. To talk about those issues, we are joined today by two leaders of cultural institutions who have made significant contributions to the development of photography in Lebanon and the Middle East, and a photographer whose documentary work has been exhibited widely and is featured in the exhibition. I would like to welcome our guests. Patrick Baz is an award-winning photographer. He covered the world's major conflicts and is also founder and executive director of the Beirut Center of Photography, a partner in our show. The center is a nonprofit organization established in 2016 and dedicated to photography and visual culture based in Beirut. The center organizes exhibitions, workshops, debates, and educational programs with the goal of positioning the Middle East and North Africa on the photography world map and the goal of making photography accessible to all. Christine Khouri is an independent researcher, writer, curator, and photographer whose research interests focus on the history of art circulation and infrastructure in the Arab world and archival practices and dissemination. Khouri is a member of the board of the Arab Image Foundation in Beirut, a nonprofit established in 1997 with the aim to collect, preserve, and study photographic material from the Middle East and its diaspora, and develop new narrative approaches and representations to collections. Their evolving collection contains more than 500,000 photographic objects. These objects date from the 1860s to the present day and span 50 countries. Their work has influenced many curators around the world and revolutionized the manner in which collections and photography are perceived across the Middle East and beyond. And last but not least, Emily Mahdi. Emily is a photographer, cinematographer based between Lebanon and Canada. Her photography tries to capture moments of humanity within difficult situations. Her rich and diverse work experiences have allowed her to develop a deep and multicultural look at life. She has been very active in 2019 and 2020 in documenting the protest movement and lately has also been recording the blast and its impact on the people and the city. Welcome to you all. It's a pleasure to host you today. I want to start with you, Emily. 
I have heard you mention that your first reaction after the blast was to grab your camera and go into the streets to try and understand what had happened. Can you talk about what you saw and how it felt? Thank you for having us today. Um, it's a pleasure talking to all of you. And I'm very happy to hear also that there were that many people who were able to be part of this exhibition, to look at the exhibition, and uh, so many positive uh, responses uh, towards it. It's uh, amazing, and I'm very happy to hear. To answer you to your question, um, during uh, the explosion, I was actually in my office that is in the middle of Ashrafiye, where the explosion uh, occurred. When everything sort of exploded in my office, the first thing I did was to run towards my camera to go down right away and see what the issue, what, what happened, uh, where was it coming from. When I was able to get to my camera in the office, I actually saw my neighbors and everything around. And I understood that it wasn't just the building or like, you know, just around like two, three buildings around. I understood that it was a lot bigger. So I ran down. And when I got down, when I went down the building, um, that's when I noticed and heard all the screams. I saw all the bleeding, the panic. It was very surreal. It was also for me very different, let's say, because I am not in a country uh, that I'm not familiar with. Uh, this is home. Usually you're taught to separate. You're taught to separate yourself from where you are taking pictures and your emotions or how you're feeling or seeing things um, to be able to really just storytell or document everything that's happening. The first moment when I saw everything that was happening, and the fear, the panic, um, the blood and everything, the first reaction I had as I was taking pictures was to call my parents, my family, my the people that I'm the closest to, just to make sure that they were safe. The second that that was done with, to take a second, a millisecond to say, okay, it's it's okay, now I can just focus on being behind the camera on documenting everything that's happening. So it was very special to see my home, my country, my people going through such disasters, such such a shock, me included. But in the in the moment I didn't actually think about how I was feeling. I was more focusing on on seeing how people were feeling, on being behind the camera because I always say and I think like many photographers say that the camera is my shield. So I sort of wanted to just keep on going and keep on taking pictures and keep on filming. And I didn't think, should I go right? Should I go left? I just went with an emotion that I saw, a person that I saw, um, a scream that I heard, a, a fear that I felt. And I kept on going and keep, kept on walking, kept on taking pictures. And I ended up in front of the port. I ended up seeing what was happening, understood where everything was coming from. Uh, we knew before that there was a fire at the port, like a bit before, but we didn't, you know, none of us thought that it was going to get this big. But running down to the port, I saw more and more and more disaster as I went down. And yeah, I think that I just kept on going since, since that minute, since that second. Um, I just kept taking pictures, I kept working, I kept filming, I kept documenting, I kept archiving and archiving as much as I can. I didn't really focus on my emotions really. My emotions for me were just shown in my pictures. If someone sees a picture that I shot, then the idea is for them to see how I was feeling through, throughout the image. Absolutely, through your lens. Emily, Obviously, you've maybe looked at some of the pictures that you've taken and you've shared some, as you say. Is there one or two pictures that you have taken that have had an impact, uh, uh, more of an impact or an emotion on you? And if yes, can you describe in seconds what that picture is? Many of my pictures, um, I felt something towards them or else I wouldn't be showing them. 
when I take a picture, I don't just snap, snap, snap. I actually take time also and I observe a lot. I'm very quiet and get into my own bubble. And um, when I shoot something, it's when I actually like really feel something towards it. So everything that I've shown for me has a specific emotion to me. Now, there is one picture that went a bit viral with this old lady uh, that was sitting um, on the sidewalk. Uh, for me, that moment was when I actually realized what was happening because as I was taking pictures, I saw her sitting there alone and sort of uh, numb, you know, looking around. She was not in shock. She was more, and now what sort of look, you know, and not the what's happening look, but the, you know, like uh, just observing, just numb. The word for me is just the numbness in her got to me. We caught each other's eyes and uh, she she sort of put her hand out for me to go to her. And I did. And when I held her hand, um, she held it so hard in a way like don't let go, sort of, you know, like she didn't want to be alone. And I think that's when I sort of took that second and looked around and realized what was happening. It was one picture for me. If, if it works, it works. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. For me, that moment was very was very clear because it was really her expression, her silence, her moment of uh, not despair, but just of numbness. Thank you, Emily. Patrick, I want to turn to you. There's almost a feeling of before and after for people, for artists, for the entire city. What has been the impact of the blast and the aftermath on, on your organization, on the projects you're involved in, on, on, on you and your team? Hi, Lynn. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's very difficult to talk about the effect that this uh, explosion uh, had on my organization, which is uh, very limited compared to the destruction of uh, half of the city. But uh, nevertheless, I guess we're here to talk about photography. And what we had, we, we, we can't do anymore is uh, exhibition uh, because uh, galleries are almost destroyed. As you know, the uh, uh, neighborhood uh, that is the most affected uh, is the uh, art neighborhood, or as we can call it in French, Le Quartier des Arts. But we're trying. Uh, what we're trying to do is now to uh, collect grants for photographers. Uh, most of them have uh, had their studios destroyed, had their equipment destroyed. Some of them can't, uh, I mean, got accepted, for example, to universities or art schools uh, in Europe and can't go there because uh, the bank uh, do not release the money or because I mean, most of their belongings have been uh, destroyed. So, So your focus is supporting them, supporting the photographers directly. Exactly. So that's what we're trying to do. So we did a print sale uh, with uh, Gulf Photo Plus uh, in Dubai for the Red Cross. Among the uh, organizations involved, involved uh, was uh, Magnum Foundation uh, and other uh, regional uh, photography organizations. So we did uh, the sale to help the uh, Red Cross. We collected uh, one hundred thousand uh, dollars for the Red Cross. So now we're trying to do the same for local NGOs, and fifty uh, percent of the sales would go to the NGOs, and the other fifty percent would go to the photographers. The problem we have is uh, also related to the uh, economic situation and to the uh, banking system. We really Hand in, working hand in hand with uh, Gulf Photo Plus in Dubai because we can't uh, get uh, money transfer in Lebanon and uh, use the money transfer. You know, we have uh, bank issues. So, uh, again, I mean, uh, Gulf Photo Plus, GPP, is helping getting this uh, in place. Uh, and we can also print for less and uh, ship internationally from Dubai. Thank you, Patrick, for sharing uh, how your organization is uh, trying to stand in solidarity with photographers and trying to respond to their immediate needs. I want to go to you, Christine. 
your office and operation, we have heard, have been severely damaged, and we know that the team and the board as well have been actively engaged in relocating the collection, the archive. What is the situation now, almost six weeks after the blast? Was it, what has happened uh, to the collection? So yes, so there was the the, the Arab Image Foundation's premises are in Jamezi as well, um, and about 800 meters from the port. And as you said, uh, there was substantial damage uh, that occurred at the office. Um, most importantly, there was one team member who was at the office at the moment of the explosion, and um, he was injured, but he's recovering, thankfully. So I think we have to remember the people before we remember the objects. One of the board members was nearby um, and also had a minor injury, um, but is is recovering. So um, I would say that the, you know, kind of just to get a sense of the damage, uh, all the glass blew out from the windows, uh, many of the doors, you know, from their frames. We have a cool storage room which houses the bulk of the collection, thankfully. Um, and that's what probably protected the collection from more significant damage. But even the fireproof doors of the of that room were damaged, which is pretty remarkable. Of course, um, equipment, computers, digitization material, they're all uh, thrown to the ground. Much of it is destroyed. Thankfully, the first assessment of the collections uh, showed that the foundation's preservation practice was efficient and effective. So most of the collection seems to be unharmed. Some of the framed objects broke. Um, some preservation boxes were damaged, but what's um, it took about 10 days for the team. And I'm to be clear, I'm not in Beirut. I was not there during the explosion. So I'm speaking to the foundation and about uh, the team that was there or that is there working. So it took the team and uh, a group of volunteers about 10 days just to clean the office and secure the collections. Um, we also, in addition to the collections, there's the workspaces and a library um, at the foundation. So it took about 10 days to clean up. Um, the digitization lab was turned into a makeshift storage area where there was minimal climate control. Um, and that's where the collections currently are. And what's been going on now and will take some time is a proper assessment of the damage to the collections. Um, so that's one of the major activities of uh, members and volunteers at the foundation today. I would say now that Weeks later, there's, you know, the team and board, and we have a new incoming director who just joined at the beginning of this month, are, you know, trying to balance their workload and their own traumas of having experienced this. And I think that's important to find that balance. So moving forward, there will be a, a proper detailed collection report for all the items of the collections. And I would say that, you know, one of the things that we're proud of is that there was an emergency plan set in place um, to deal with moments of crises. Many institutions um, who care for or stewards or custodians of cultural heritage or archival material have emergency plans. And we're lucky that that disaster or emergency plan was in place to sort of follow to a certain extent after the uh, explosion. So moving forward, you know, we are uh, currently trying to set up the office to be functional again, in addition to the work around assessing the collections. We are considering finding another space to move into, and we would need to rebuild our cool storage room. So, you know, we're also trying to use this opportunity to think a bit more nimbly about what it means to have uh, to work in Lebanon, to preserve collections that require electricity and, you know, cool storage to think about the environmental considerations, but also um, sort of the precarity in the country and the minimal resources. So we're also using this opportunity to see how uh, we can address those questions. I hear you, uh, Christine. And it, it almost feels as if our you know, entire world is convulsing. So much is at stake right now, particularly in Lebanon, but also regionally and even globally, uh, the pandemic revealed so many flaws in the systems that govern our lives. Um, and we need to rethink so many things about ourselves, our societies, and our systems. Patrick, in your opinion, what is the role of photography in this sort of massive 
sort of transformational period? How can organizations like yours, which are also platforms for for conversation using photography, be engaged in this conversation and in, the, in this time of sort of transformation? What we try to do is try to find uh, photographers that are not celebrities, and uh, we're trying to promote them. We're really looking for a different approach on uh, what's happening in Lebanon or what happened uh, recently, trying to put them in touch with uh, international organization because you know that uh, in Lebanon, we don't have uh, any platform uh, that uh, is, uh, as I would say, has a visual approach to uh, the history of the country or to the events that are happening. Uh, the problem with the Arab world is that uh, the media are always focusing on words and uh, not on uh, do not give space uh, to visual journalism. So uh, that's what we're trying to uh, to do on our side. We're trying to help photographers uh, get connections outside, uh, get visibility. Uh, on international platforms. Through my uh, my career, I uh, managed to build uh, international uh, connections uh, in photography and uh, with uh, international media, international organizations. So we're, we're all trying to gather together. Uh, it's impressive the amount of calls and emails uh, for help from uh, international organization I got on how they can uh, help photographers uh, in Lebanon. And uh, so, yes, that's our aim. What do you think photography, as a visual story, why do you think it is important to tell it visually? Well, uh, the difference uh, between uh, photography and cinematography is that photography captures a specific moment that uh, you will always remember. Uh, photography is a memory. Photography is there. Uh, to help you remember everything that happened. And photography is a very subjective approach, and that's what's interesting in photography. It's your eye. It's a different eye from every different... Every photographer has a different eye and a different approach. So it's not about only one photographer. It's about different approach on a specific subject. That's what makes it uh, interesting. And it's also related to uh, the lens you use, the light the uh, frame. Uh, so you have a specific moment that was caught by, I would say now nowadays we have like, I don't know, on the specific event that happened on the explosion, I would recall a hundred photographers. So imagine if you can collect the work of a hundred photographer, photographers on this, on this specific event. That's what makes it interesting. It's a different approach. You will barely find a similar image on this event. Christine, I, I want to turn to you. Collecting, archiving, preserving have not been and are not, you know, a forty for the country nor the region. But amidst what we are discussing, amidst the 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 the, 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 the catastrophe, the horrific catastrophe in Lebanon and the global backdrop, how important is the role of archiving in in this time of crisis and social transformation and questioning? Well, I think that, you know, maybe while it maybe is not perceived as a forte of the country or the region, I think there are a lot of uh, remarkable independent initiatives uh, that have and, and individual projects, um, whether it be it by academics or artists, uh, filmmakers, uh, activists, to document and to archive life in these cities, whether it's through um, photographic materials or otherwise. So I think the answer is maybe obvious in moments of crises like this, we need to remember and we need to document and safeguard kind of these materials so that the histories, um, you know, 20, 30, 50 years from now, when people look back and um, have access to or can see in one way or another the images taken by these photographers today, you know, the, the oral history, the memories, um, the testimony of what happened, uh, because precisely it's um, the people do the work of the state in many ways in, in Lebanon and in many parts of the world. And so this there's an even more of an urgency that um, the citizens are able to 
preserve uh, this uh, these memories and this moment because it's precisely about power and writing history. And so it's on all of us uh, to document, to preserve what is happening right now. And, you know, that's a big burden <laughs> to a certain extent. Um, and, and one is, it's not about, uh, archiving is not about saving everything, but I think that uh, it's, it's important now, especially for uh, the community, which I think is uh, coming together to support each other um, in the work that they're doing. And there's been an outpouring of support, not only internationally, but locally between organizations, between institutions to support each other in their work and preserving their archives. Absolutely. And, and Christine, if I may, I mean, the Arab Image Foundation has been, I mean, one, one of the goals is also to come up with alternative ra- narratives, right, to counter the image ideas that become sort of associated with a place and to come up with alternative narratives through this, you know, archives, through projects and research projects and exhibitions. What are your thoughts on this from the perspective of the foundation's work? Absolutely. I mean, I think many independent uh, organizations or projects that do the work of documenting and archiving are um, in it because they want to create spaces um, or find a need to uh, offer spaces to document and for others to come and facilitate the research around writing different narratives. Narratives from those in power are precisely, you know, those in power are the ones who are at fault for uh, this explosion. So the narratives coming out from the state are not exactly the ones that are to be believed. And so it is on all of us to make sure that uh, our voices are heard, or rather the voices of the people who have experienced this, who can reveal um, what is truly going on, that they're heard. And so absolutely, whether they're, I think alternative is maybe alternative to the official or a state narrative. As you know, there's a the textbooks in Lebanon um, really end in 1975, writing the history after or of the Civil War is um, contested still. And many of the people who were involved in that are still in power today. And so it's uh, even more urgent uh, these days to make sure that spaces and in- initiatives that are giving voice to uh, those who are documenting, who are photographing, who are recording um, and preserving this, uh, these histories, um, you know, supporting those uh, initiatives is even more urgent. Thank you, Emily. You know, there is certainly the need to document, to document tragedy, to record it uh, so people see it. But there's also a danger that those images can become the only visual that is associated to a place, you know, forging stereotypes in people's minds about a place. And, and, you know, we all know that Beirut is associated to a war-torn city. And, you know, no matter what, this seems to be catching up with the city. What are your thoughts on this? Where does your work sit in relation to this? You know, to follow up a bit on what Christine was saying, they say it's the winners who write the history. Our biggest problems in Lebanon today affecting at least two to three generations is not only that we never had a winner, let's say, but that our history books literally stops in 1975. And that's like 45 years ago. So I do agree that me personally, me, let's say personally, I want and I people need to look at things more objectively. And this is why I think archiving is so important. The way I take pictures, the way I want to shoot and you know film and take images of anything I can, everything I can, everything that for me has a meaning, and I really try to be as unbiased as I can, it's to tell myself that maybe, hopefully, one day, everything I am taking could be part of history, could be in a history book, could be talked about could be not just, you know, uh, oh yeah, this was, you know, this happened in Lebanon, but that it's actually written somewhere. And I think that I would like my images or anyone, a photographer's images, everything that has happened, historically speaking, in, in Lebanon, to be recorded, to be archived, to be used, to be, to be heard, you know, like, let's say me, for example, I published a book actually uh, in December uh, called Thaura Bisura, 
which is the 51st days of uh, the revolution. Um, I divided it in five different emotions and I kept it extremely simple. And I wrote my feelings, my, my, my thoughts in a very objective way. And for me, it was for people to have an archive, to hold on to something, to, to remember by, to think of these first 50 days that were so, the two first months that, that, you know, changed something in Lebanon, you know, that people were voicing were, were on, were on the ground in a way that for me and my, for my age and for who I am today, I have never seen before. And I wanted to, to archive it. I wanted to take pictures of it. I wanted, I, I don't want people to forget the energy, the emotion, the, how people were affected and how much of a change people really believe could happen. And this is why I do what I do. This is why I love what I do. Because for me, even if it's just one image that could, you know, be remembered, it could be one image that could speak to people, one image that could change or affect someone or something or somehow do something, it's important. And hopefully our books, you know, or the next generation will have something to read, to, to look at, to talk about. Yes. Thank you so much, Emily. Unfortunately, our time is coming to an end. But 30 seconds before we close, how can people support you? Patrick? Well, they uh, need to support uh, photographers by uh, first, we, when the moment we'll uh, launch the uh, crowdfund for a grant, uh, people need to uh, help uh, buy prints from photographers. Uh, that will allow them to start again uh, buying equipment or rebuilding their studio. And uh, they will have uh, all the information on uh, Facebook or Twitter. It's uh, Beirut Center of Photography or even Instagram, of course, uh, we're there. So we'll, uh, we'll publish everything uh, in the upcoming uh, 10 days. And uh, hopefully uh, we will collect uh, some fund. Uh, to help all the uh, Lebanese photographers in need. Thank you. Christine, can I go to you? How can people help support the Arab Image Foundation? Uh, thank you. I mean, first, I think it's important that people are, again, supporting um, wide across different, um, you know, relief efforts. Uh, when it comes to culture, there are a number of larger funds to support the Arab Fund for Arts and Culture and Maud al-Thakafi initiated the Lebanon Solidarity Fund to fundraise for the community at large. And so I would recommend uh, going to the you know, to either of their websites. As for the Arab Image Foundation, um, you can uh, go to the arabimagefoundation.org and click on donate. And there are different ways um, in which you can support financially through expertise, through in-kind donation. But we're certainly looking forward to, um, you know, we want to thank everyone that has uh, come forward and supported so far. Um, individuals, organizations, um, but also thinking that this is this is a long-term project uh, for Lebanon. This is not something that's just happening right now. So I think sustaining the support, um, sustaining the conversation around this crisis um, is extremely important. And uh, you know, and the hope is that organizations like the Arab Image Foundation, photographers in Lebanon, and other individuals um, continue to document and collect. You know, this moment. Um, because it's, uh, you know, if anything, what this blast has shown is that the systems in place are not working. And so it's, uh, you know, we need to collect the histories to allow us to make visible these problems um, and uh, sort of the situation that the country has been going through. Our time has come to an end, and I want to thank our guests, Patrick Baz, Christine Khoury, and Emily Madi for being with us today. Please follow us on Twitter at MEI Arts Culture. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support.